Okay, we're back. We're live for the 4 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And Mitch Ewan and I are alone at last on Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And <laughs> hi, Mitch. <laughs> Aloha, Jay. Coming so, to you from my palatial corner office up in HNEI in UH Manoa. I think it's beautiful. It's a, it's a statement of academia. It's a statement of research and development. And it's a statement of, of you, Mitch. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because I have no windows, just like when I used to serve on submarines. No windows. <laughs> so I'm used to it. <laughs> so the reason we started a little late today was because we were uh, on the hookup with uh, Lou Pugliarisi of... Uh, Energy in America. He joins us from EPRING, Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington. And we were talking about energy prices and how they have dropped right. precipitously and how that affects the, the price of oil and how that in turn affects the economy in uh, most ways bad, but in some ways good. Uh, it's probably going to lead to lower prices at the pump. Um, and, and for that matter, unfortunately, uh, it competes against renewables. Uh, because it's easier to buy a car when you have cheap gas out there. Um, so right. this, this will have some effect, and nobody knows how long the effect will, will last. Uh, we are in a transitional time. We don't know where we're going right now, and it's a matter of uh, really watching things carefully. Therefore, uh, the open house program that uh, Hawaiian Electric has been talking about uh, becomes important. It's an engagement between the public and the utility. It's an opportunity to really talk, to ask questions, get answers, and, uh, you know, share thoughts, especially in these difficult times. Interestingly, uh, you know, when everybody is discouraging meetings, you know, hundreds of people showed up last night. That was impressive. And they didn't yeah. shake hands. <laughs> they didn't shake hands. But... Well, there was a lot of elbowing going on. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a, a moderated discussion with... Um, you know, everybody uh, on the panel, there were about six people on the panel and they were uh, answering questions by the moderator and they were, you know, giving their, you know, opening views and followed by right. questions uh, on Meeting Sift, which is a program that ThinkTech has been close with for a long time. I was happy to see right. them use that program. Um, and, uh, you know, we left around 7.15 or so, you stayed and you saw more of the discussion and more of the Q&A. But can we go through yes. this from the outset? Uh, you know, how, how did it, how did it um, work there? I mean, you had six people all with different points of view um, talking about mm, energy, energy future, whether we're doing it right or wrong, and uh, I guess providing context for the, for the uh, utility. Uh, but how did it go? Well, first of all, I'd like to say it was a really first-class event. I thought it was really well organized. I was really encouraged to see uh, the senior leadership uh, from Hawaiian Electric showed up or starting off with the new president, uh, uh, um, Sue. Yeah, Scott, Scott um, Sue was there. Oh, He's sorry, still taking office right brain, about now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and a lot of his VPs were there. So that was really good that uh, leadership uh, from the top uh, showed up and uh, it was really well organized. I mean, right from arriving uh, in the parking lot to getting, it was down in Aloha Tower at HPU, really good uh, uh, setting. And like I said, well organized. And yes, they had uh, the panel and it was an interesting panel. It was, uh, you know, uh, thought provoking. I would say uh, all the speakers um, had their own slant on uh, where we're going. Now this was an integrated grid planning exercise and the mm -hmm. whole idea community. So it, it it consisted of a, like you said, the panel giving, you know, their views, uh, and then backed up by SIFT, where, you, like you said, you could uh, dial in a question, and they were like, by the time uh, at the end of the evening, there were almost sixty to sixty-five questions, um, and um, Hawaiian Electric says that I mean they only answered a few of the questions which they asked the panel to comment on, and there was no really discussion directly with the audience other than the audience got to ask the questions. But Hawaiian Electric did say that they would answer every question and uh, they would be available on the website and they had a nice brochure with uh, good contact information on how you could get to their website and, and look at the questions and answers. So the interesting thing will be to see what the answers are and how, and how well they address them. But overall, I thought it, uh, you know, the panelists uh, presented a broad view 
starting with the local community and social justice and, and those kinds of issues to how do you implement a project? And it's a really tough challenge. Everybody admitted that. I mean, land is getting scarce. Uh, I was particularly impressed with the guy from the farm board, but he represented the farmers. And uh, we're raised, basically running out of agricultural land. And, and you know what he highlighted was this constant push, pressure to accept you know, the best land we have pushing to put PV on it. And that was kind of pushing the farmers out and making it even tougher for them to A, farm and afford their land. And also, you know, we can't grow food on land. And, and the only kind of, ag, you know, they, they talked about dual use and the only dual use so far has been running sheep uh, underneath the uh, panels to munch the grass, to keep the grass down. And I guess you could slaughter sheep or you can get the get their wool. but you know, not uh, kind of a one crop and not maybe the best use of that land. So that, that was pretty interesting and really highlighted the point that the, the first speaker, Cynthia, I don't, didn't catch her last name, talked about impacted communities. Like they don't put a wind turbine or these big uh, facilities in the backyard of uh, a Kola, Kolahala um, uh, neighborhood. Let, they push them out to the Sinai and the, and the West Coast and, and uh, up in the, uh, on the North Shore and push them on those residents. And the, and the comment is, why are we there the brunt of these projects? And that's basically not fair. And, you know, I thought she made a very strong point on that. And the, and the other part of it was Pono Shim came on and said, look, you know, they don't talk to us. They talk down, to, the developers come in and they talk down to us. There he is, a picture of Pono Shim. Very interesting presentation. I've got to say, memorable, because you know, he spread this blanket out on the floor, characterizing it as Hawaii is in the middle of this blue blanket, i.e. we're in the middle of the ocean. And then all these guys come down from the mainland telling us, you know, they're here to help and dumping all these theories on top of us. So he's had all these library books that he piled on this, on this blanket. And at the end of the day, he said, we don't need these guys telling us how to live. This is our home. And he picked up the blanket and flung the books, you know, around the front of the room. So you might not like the way he got the message, but everybody's gonna remember that. So from the point of view of communicating an idea, I thought it was really effective. I mean, you know, you have talking heads like most panelists, you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So by the time the next panelist gets on, well, what, what did that I got? You know, I kind of miss it in all the noise. So Pono made a really good point. And, that, and that's kind of what this open house is all about, is not like forcing these projects on all of us without thinking about how it affects us. Like, you know, the, the big wigs, you know, who own the banks. I mean, they're, like I say, they don't have a wind turbine in their backyard like maybe the guys out in Kahuku do. So, like, you know, what's fair? And the, and the big question I had is, okay, given all this, how do you actually, is it impossible? The question, is it actually impossible now? Are we getting to the point where it's impossible to put in these large uh, energy, renewable energy projects, certainly on Oahu, because... You know, basically, we're running out of land. I mean, the land owners, uh, you know, they get more money from putting in developments and housing estates, and it's push, 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 push. And, you know, it may take them 10, 15, 20 years to get that housing development in there. But in the end, it seems they always win and we always lose. So go ahead and comment on that, Jay. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I will. I, um, you know, I, I found that uh, everybody, as you said, was coming from his own silo, uh, his own, you know, interest group, one kind or another. And you mentioned yeah. a number of them, and it's certainly worth uh, discussing that. But in, in an overarching sense, um, my concern was I, I, I would have liked to see some, you know, direct discussion and pushback on what they were saying. I, I didn't particularly agree with Cynthia. And, and the first question that was asked is how come, uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, wind uh, turbines are being installed in rural areas? Where are you going to install them? Downtown on Bishop Street? The only place is yeah, rural right. areas. And, and, and we have a real contention about that. Do you, do you like uh, uh, solar more than wind? If you make a, a solar farm, it takes lots more acreage. Even though the blades on a turbine are, you know, 150, 200 feet wide, 
um, you're not using up all the land as you would in a large uh, solar you know, facility. So um, you know, don't say that uh, wind takes more land than in the solar. It doesn't. Um, they're, you know, maybe they're equivalent. In any event, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the activist approach to this. I appreciate the, uh, the notion of, uh, you know, we have to get buy-in from everybody. But at the end of the day, there were two things on the chart of, um, the chart of inclinations, the chart of priorities, if you will, that they showed on Meeting Sift at the outset. And the largest yeah. uh, group that answered that, uh, the largest uh, pr priority was let's have renewable energy. Okay, well, that's a state goal. It's been a state goal for 10 years or more. Um, and we, we can't lose sight of that. The worst thing that happens is, you know, one generation of, um, of, of, of political thinkers makes a decision and they go through a whole process about trying to implement the decision. They have trouble doing it. Now another generation comes in and they throw that decision out and start from scratch. We have seen that so many times. Let's remember that we, that we adopted renewable energy for climate change and so many other reasons. Um, and we have to keep on that. The second preference, priority, if you will, was reliability, as I recall. Um, and reliability, you know, lest we forget, everybody assumes every day, every minute, that the lights are on, that these computers work, that we have energy that's reliable, it doesn't brown out or black out or fail, and we have to make sure that happens. Now, when we get into these, these weeds about, well, where are we going to put it? Where are we going to allow it? Let's, let's oppose this and have a long conversation about that. Uh, what we're really doing is putting both of those priorities off the table. Uh, it's hard to do renewables if there's no place to put them. And it's hard to do um, you know, reliability when you, when you cannot actually go you know, do what you decided to do. So I, and I would have liked to see more pushback on her. Um, and on uh, Murray, uh, uh, Murray from uh, uh, Elopono, I thought that was very useful. He was talking about uh, the capital concentrations and uh, how we plan and how we and how we socialize these things, because that's the bottom line, I think, of this whole discussion and all the, uh, you know, the gatherings that Hawaiian Electric has organized around the state is we, we need to socialize things. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, we also have to uh, look at more than you know, me, 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 and NIMBY, and I want this, and you can't do that. But we have to look at those, those priorities and make sure that we keep on track to, you know, have reliable uh, and renewable uh, energy. Let me go down uh, one more. Pono, I knew what Pono was going to say before he said it, because he's okay. into Aloha. <laughs> and we have, you know, and, and I think that applies to everything in the state, probably everything in the world, including uh, coronavirus. Um, that, you know, we have to care for each other. We have to be a community and everybody has to have a say. And, and uh, we all ought to be mindful of, um, you know, the, of the Hawaiian values because that's, that's what makes this place special. At the same time, as I said before, I think the conversation has to include the realities and the needs we have agreed uh, we have to have. Let's see, I'm trying to remember who was after Pono. Uh, oh, the farm, the farm. Yeah. The Farm Bureau guy. Yeah. I missed somebody. I know I missed somebody here. Um, uh, uh, Josh Strickland. Oh, Josh was, Strickland. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Josh Stanbro. 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 Yeah, Stanbro. Uh, he's Sorry. a fellow who uh, organized a lawsuit against the oil companies, uh, which yeah. was filed just in the last few days. And my reaction to that lawsuit is, is this the right time? <laughs> Don't we have other fish to yeah. fry right now? And this is going to take a lot of time and energy, uh, not money, because it's a contingent fee. Uh, with a firm in San Francisco, uh, but nevertheless, I would like to see our climate change people, um, you know, spend their time. I hope they still are, um, you know, on moving the needle ahead in terms of, uh, you know, our renewable energy, uh, you know, goals and projects. Um, and and he is, he was, he's a very strong figure in the city, and uh, his commission is very important. And I hope we can get him on the show soon uh, to talk about the connection between his commission and climate change and energy and. Uh, all the purposes that we have to blend together on this. The next one, and I, I don't want to spend uh, the time that you did because I think it's very important with uh, Brian of uh, the farm, the farm group, the farmers group. Yeah. This is, you know, this is very, very interesting. I'm so glad they had him in that panel um, because we, we so often we forget about farming, we forget about agriculture in general, 
And I think we have a kind of a crisis here because we used to have agriculture. We don't have so much agriculture anymore. We are clearly unable to feed ourselves. Only McDonald's has a 30-day 30, 30 uh, supply of food, and food becomes important <laughs> in, in a time when the supply chain is threatened by coronavirus. Uh, so, yeah. you know, uh, it, it will take a long time from now to the time we become self-sustaining, but we always have to think about it. You know, and the problem I see is... Um, um, Yes, we have to give land to the farmers, but, but, but that does not emanate from the, the sheer fact that the, the farmers don't have land. Uh, we, we have to actually make it available to them. Uh, we have to find uh, large uh, landowners that will sell it to them at reasonable prices and not land bank it for generations, not hold on to right. it for a, a stunning profit at the end of the day. We have to find people willing to finance their purchases. We don't have that. So the average small farmer, the, the farmer we hope for, you know, we want to rely on going forward for the next mm -hmm. generation of Hawaii, he has very few options and nobody is really helping him or her. And I would like to see those things happen. And I think that comes before choosing exactly what land we're talking about and whether the, you know, the farming uh, activity is competing with the energy activity. I'm not sure that's the real issue. The real issue is making it possible for farmers to come out of school at UH, at Sitar, uh, know a lot about farming and the science of farming and actually be able to do it on their own land. You can't build a, a farm without capital and you can't borrow uh, without owning the land. And you can't own the land without somebody who will fund you. So right now we have a, you know, we have a, a dysfunctional system and we have to address that first. Uh, but I think it's very important that they have them down there to talk about land use. And uh, let's see, and land use was the next, who was the next speaker? Do you recall? Uh, it was, uh, uh, um, oh, Ching, last name? Uh, yeah, Col Colton. It was Colton Ching oh. from from Hawaiian yeah, right. Electric, and I was glad they had somebody, especially uh, of the you know the high office of Colton Ching at Hawaiian Electric. He's, yeah. he's a vice president, a senior vice president. Very important. We hear from Hawaiian Electric in a program like this, yeah. and it's very important that he spoke. And he's he's very succinct. He's very direct. Yeah. And uh, he picked up on Brian's thought about land use in an island state. It's very important yeah. about land. We only have a limited amount of land. And when you talk about right. energy, energy does take land, especially renewable energy. And he made that point. And at that point, we went to our how many 60 questions and so forth. Um, right. And right. I would have liked to have seen those questions discussed in greater detail. I would, have, I would have liked to have seen, you know, comments by more than one person is the way it was working out. One person was commenting on one question. But what about other, other members of the panel? What about the people yeah. in the audience commenting on the answers? Um, maybe that's just the way it has to work, but uh, I would like to see, um, you know, more, 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 mm, what do you call it, active conversation on all of those questions. So that's how well, I feel thought. about it. Those are my thoughts. Okay, so, so thought, well, maybe that's an area, because, you know, this is an energy policy forum uh, um, show, where, you know, sponsored. I mean, maybe there's an, there's an area that the uh, energy policy forum can weigh in. And we could take that on as a project just internally ourselves is to uh, look at all those questions and the answers and then respond to them, send them out to our membership and make sure that we have some input into that. I mean, we have this new program that Sherilyn's, uh, we is uh, uh, promoting uh, for networking. And uh, so here's a good, uh, here's a network that's been set up for us by Hawaiian Electric and organization should uh, be more involved in what the answers are. and and ask even more penetrating questions. So um, one of the things that uh, I was a little bit disappointed in, uh, obviously, was the electrification of transportation. So we're just totally focused, it appears, on electric vehicle, battery electric vehicle charging stations. And uh, no comment, I mean, I read the transport electrification of transportation uh, plan that Hawaiian Electric prepared, and they blew off hydrogen in one paragraph, oh, it's not ready yet, it's too expensive, uh, round trip efficiency, all the normal uh, uh, things against hydrogen. They had no hydrogen guy on any of their working groups. And I think that's a, a serious uh, hole in their, uh, in their electrification plan because uh, hydrogen vehicles are electric vehicles and they can certainly help absorb uh, renewable energy off the grid and uh, energy storage. I mean, you know, 
Battery uh, battery storage can only be short term. I ran this by our guys here up at the HNEI just yesterday uh, to talk about uh, energy storage. And batteries are great for short time storage, like minutes, hours, maybe a day. But anything over that, you have to use hydrogen. That's the only thing that makes sense. So if you want to go energy storage for a week or a month, uh, that's the medium of choice. So we need to, Hawaiian Electric, I believe, needs to start looking more seriously at the hydrogen opportunity we have. We're, we've got our great program going on the Big Island right now, so hopefully we'll have some buses running soon and we'll be able to demonstrate it. I do understand it sounds a lot like vaporware now, but we're going to transition from vaporware to actually uh, wheels on the road very soon. So that's my comment there. And it's going to cost a lot of money to put in the additional infrastructure required to charge those cars. You know, uh, you know, it's okay when you have, you know, three or 4,000 cars, but ha what happens when you get, you know, 500,000 cars, you know, parked in driveways all wanting to charge at the same time? I mean, can our wires and transformers hack the load? Most it's not, people it's not say really it efficient can't. either, is it? You know, one thing no, that not. was that was running in my mind uh, through this, um, there was it wasn't really discussed is uh, uh, this this whole notion. Oh, here we are in Oahu. We don't have enough land, and we have people who say that you know don't don't go in my backyard, and I don't I don't want you near me, and and it's unfair that you don't have a windmill on Bishop Street. Uh, you're trying to put a windmill in Haula instead. Mm, that's rural. You know, that's that's my neighborhood. Stay away. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm troubled by that right. because what, what it points up is that, is that um, each island, you know, is in its own silo and we do not share. Uh, the question is, is this an island state or a state of islands? Uh, is each island with its own persona, its own self-interest, its own view of the world? Or are we going to some, sometime get, get together on things? I actually think around statehood, people were more you know, state oriented. They seem to be yeah. island oriented now, even though we're, you know, 50 years later. So uh, what, I, what I was thinking actually was, was that it's really regrettable uh, that the Lanai uh, pipeline, the Lanai, uh, you know, power line never got yeah. off the ground. Everybody was opposing that. A, a, few, a few people stopped it and it was very highly politicized and all that. And it was tragic in the sense that that would have been an equalization, an equalization of the producer on one island and the user on another island. So then we wouldn't be talking about not having enough room on one island um, and having room on the other island, but not able to get the energy from one to the other. I mean, it seems clearer and clearer that we have to equalize that. Now, you can say that there are you know, that the whales are affected by a power line uh, through the channel. You can say that, um, uh, oh, gee, was, I don't know what, uh, the objections that were made uh, to the yeah, power right. line, uh, none of which I felt were legit. Um, and so no, we don't have it. It's probably radioactive as a political issue. It's not coming back anytime soon. But I want to join you in the thought that there is a way not only to store energy in the state of Hawaii, uh, but to move it around in the state of Hawaii. Uh, you could go to PGV and you could put them, you could make hydrogen, put them in tanks. You could hold the tanks, store the tanks, ship the tanks, move the tanks all over the state at relatively minimal cost. And you can leave them there until you need them. Um, and that would equalize the production of oh. energy and the use of energy all over the state. We have that resource and we have that technology. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, that or cable, either way. Uh, is is quite appropriate for the state of Hawaii, and we should focus on that. I don't think we think about it at all these days, but we should think about it. So one of my first projects when I came to HNEI was to look at just at that, and and, and really the conclusion uh, was that Oahu will have a very difficult time of becoming self-sufficient uh, with energy, but all the other islands can become self-sufficient, and in fact, as you said, have excess capacity that can be shipped here to Oahu. So what's the alternative? Are we just going to, Oahu is going to import expensive fuels from, uh, you know, 2,500 miles away? Or are we going to import it from our neighbor islands and the neighbor islands get an economic benefit out of it and we get to use our energy? And the other, and the, uh, you know, the other part, the other question I raise is, well, if uh, we can't get the energy, then we're going to have to move the people. So let's migrate, out-migrate from Oahu 
and start you know moving to the neighbor islands. So for example, we could move all the all the state over to the Big Island or Maui. And so we balance the load that way. Um, maybe dumb to say something like that, but you know, what's it gonna be? As we keep on building up our population, more and more and more people, something's gotta give. Yes, and, right. Uh, so something's gotta give. You gotta pay the piper one way or the other. You either well, you know, this, this raises other issues. From, uh, it raises other yeah. issues that are total, totally related. You know, the farm issue, for example, with Superferry, we would have been able to deliver diversified agriculture products all over the state, cheap. Yeah. Um, and we blew that. And, and, and the super ferry is another radioactive issue that is not going to come right. back anytime soon. Um, you know, and she has so well, you sad. hear people talking again about a ferry, just like it's what, been uh, eight or nine years. So the cycle is repeating itself. But who's well, going to invest in a ferry, given what happened? Who's going to invest in another 30 meter telescope project? I mean, we just keep shooting ourselves in the foot. Yeah. by uh, taking on these positions of not right. in my backyard, but I'm not going to let you have it either. So, you know, pretty selfish, actually. So this so really maybe demands a, guys a, like, a higher uh, level of thinking, don't you? It demands a statewide analysis yeah. of uh, all the resources in the state and all the demands in the state. And, and look, looking back at things that maybe failed politically, but shouldn't have failed and trying to re-implement them now uh, and moving it into the 21st century and I don't know where coronavirus fits in all of that, but when you have, you know, as you heroes said yesterday, a substantial degradation of our economy in the next few months, well, in fact, right now, yeah. but lasting for a while, um, then maybe you have to rethink some fundamental points about how the state operates. What do you think? I absolutely agree. I, I read a book a long time ago called Taking Care of Number One. And the, the main, one of the main themes is people will not take any action until they are hurting. So I remember when I first came to Hawaii, Henry Curtis asked me, what will it take to get hydrogen in the state? And I said, five to $10 a gallon gasoline. It's when people are really hurting, then they're gonna start looking at the alternatives. Right now, despite everything that's going on, we're all in our comfort zones. Like you said, I turn on my light here in my office, it happens if I'm only allowed to use the lighting like three or four hours a day because we don't have the energy to generate all the electricity we need to run this place. I wanna make one comment on the fossil fuel companies. I haven't met yet one fossil fuel company executive who hasn't been pro-renewable energy. And uh, you know, don't tar the current uh, management with the sins, uh, so-called sins behalf, uh, of the past. I mean, we all bought the oil and we all enjoyed it and we all loved it. And we all have these big monster cars and trucks here in Hawaii. We love these monster trucks. Just try to park in some of the parking spots beside some big, huge pickup truck. So we, we're we still using a lot of oil just to get that monster truck moved around. So, yeah, you know, well, we're, not say we're, not, we're, not, we're not oil companies anymore. Yeah. We are energy companies. Yes. So and talking better, to like Al Chi, you know, yeah. he says, Hey, if there's a demand for hydrogen or some other kind of renewable fuel, or it could be biodiesel, we'll supply it. So it's what you're what you ask for. We're in business to supply the needs of our customers. It's a customer, so we shouldn't be suing the oil companies. We should be suing ourselves because we're the people <laughs> that keep them in business. You heard it on Think Tech Hawaii. Yeah. Well, Mitch, if if I were you, I I know what you would say now. You would say, Jay, we're out of time. It's time to go.